Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here and giving me the opportunity to talk with you about kind of a new area of our work at Policy Engine, which is around uh, energy policy. So as some background, um, you know, I spent much of my career in, in the tech world and then got into economic policy and built Policy Engine to try to democratize access to the kinds of models you see at the Congressional Budget Office, think tanks like the Tax Policy Center and Tax Foundation. Um, and most of these have to do with individual income tax and benefit policies like food stamps. Um, but along the way, we found that there was an uh, important gap in terms of modeling those kinds of individualized impacts when it comes to energy policies like potentially a carbon tax or uh, the UK, for example, did an energy price guarantee. So some of these supply and demand side policies um, really have an impact on the economy overall, the energy um, forecast. So I'm really excited for the, um, the presentation, I think at 1.30 today, that's gonna go more into simulating those kinds of uh, policies, but also the impact on individuals. So um, I'm gonna talk with you today about um, our work in Policy Engine, bringing that to the forefront using completely open source software. So I'll start by just describing what Policy Engine is, and then move on to uh, two or three demos, depending on timing. Um, so in particular, I'm gonna start here in the US, where there are a number of policies, um, LIHEAP, you may have heard of this. Michigan has a version of that policy, which is a low income uh, home energy assistance program that's done through the tax code. So I'll show what the impacts of that policy are on an individual. And then I'll uh, potentially talk about clean vehicle tax credit and also a carbon dividend in the UK. So uh, this is not a policy that exists, but it's a policy that our model is capable of forecasting the impact of. Um, and finally, I'll talk about where we're headed next and potentially uh, you know, opportunities to partner with you all, especially given the open nature of this event. So high level, Policy Engine, we are a nonprofit and an open source software platform for public policy analysis. So a few things you can do with the platform. Um, and you know, our mission throughout this is really openness and transparency. We're trying to compute the impact of policy for everyone. So whether you're a policy expert or just an individual trying to understand how these policies affect you, whether you're in the UK, US, we're building a model in Canada as well, um, everything is available free and open source. And uh, there's quite a number of organizations that use Policy Engine. Uh, we started in the UK in 2021 and launched in the US in 2022. But already we're seeing uh, usage across the political spectrum. The Green Party in the UK has used Policy Engine for evaluating their manifesto. And also the Center for Policy Studies is actually uh, the most prominent conservative think tank in the UK. So we're really excited about that uh, bipartisan nature. And then here in the US, we've had organizations that are working on benefit access benefit analysis, and even uh, recognition as a digital public good from the UN, and adoption around the world as well. So what can you do with Policy Engine? If you're an individual, and I'll show this in, in a live demo in a moment, you can enter some information about yourself, and we'll calculate your taxes and your benefits. If you're a policy analyst, you can design a custom policy or form, so tweak any of those knobs that influence the design of those policies, potentially introduce a new policy, and once you've done that, you can compute the impact on a household of that reform, and we have a micro simulation model similar to what CBO has that estimates the impact of reforms on society overall. So how much is it gonna cost? Who wins, who loses? What does effect uh, does it have on the poverty rate, on income inequality, and so on? We also provide a web API. So there are two uh, partners that we've had so far that are building their own experiences, helping people navigate the benefit system using our API. So they don't have to code up all the rules for all those tax and benefit programs. They just go to our API. They don't have to host it. It's just uh, through our compute. And now they're building really innovative solutions that cater to their particular communities in terms of helping them um, access benefits that they're eligible for. So the thing that's underpinning all of this is an open source rules engine. So we have a model that says, given your household characteristics, here is what you owe in taxes at the federal, state, and even local level. Um, and here's the benefits like food stamps you might be eligible for. 
And once you do that for an individual scenario under current law, you can do it for an alternative scenario if you've parameterized it correctly. And you can pair it with representative survey data. This is what is called a microsimulation model. And that's what allows you to run it not just on one household, but hundreds of thousands of households to give you a flavor of um, what the impact is on society overall. I also want to talk briefly about, before the demo, sort of our uh, interaction with open source community. We are entirely open source, so both our front end and the back end, the rules engine, the API, um, and our machine learning models that we've developed to enhance our microdata, um, all of that is open source at github.com slash policy engine. So we leverage a lot of open source software. Um, you know, we're a Python stack, we use React. There's also a rules engine framework that the French government developed for their own modeling called OpenFisca. So we, that's just really catapult to our progress. Um, it's been around for about 10 years and we have been contributing to that software. Um, so both at the specialized and um, general level, we are big fans of open source software. I think the only thing which I, I might show you later on is uh, we do use GPT-4 instead of open source LLMs, but we're exploring LLMs on that front too. And of course we have a range of open source software um, packages that we build. So we have a model for every country we operate in and also some of the behind the scenes magic, um, machine learning, data processing, all of that we make open source and present at various conferences. I was just checking our progress and uh, so far this year we've had about 700 merge pull requests from dozens of um, open source contributors around the world. And we only have a uh, full-time staff of uh, three technical people. So we're really proud of that community engagement. And of course, a bunch of other tools. We use GitHub Actions, GitHub Pages, um, you know, PPI or PIP, and a lot of methodologies that I think have advanced the open source um, ecosystem as well, test-driven development. And there's an uh, organization that we are a member of called the Policy Simulation Library. Some of you may be interested in joining this as well. It's a nonprofit that's dedicated to advancing open source in the uh, arena of public policy analysis. Okay, so enough talking uh, without interactive demos. Here we're gonna look at that program I described earlier. So the Michigan Home Heating Credit is a version of the Light Heap program that Michigan has, uh, every state has their own Light Heap rules. It, even it goes down to the county level and sometimes utility uh, company level, those rules. So we're gonna simulate what that policy means for an individual household and how it affects their incentives in terms of consumption of um, heating. Uh, fuels. So just a little bit of background on this program. Um, as I mentioned, this is the implementation of the LIHEAP program in Michigan. It's very complex. So it's a two-page form, but it's a very dense two pages. There are 47 questions. Here's the second page of that. Um, and the instruction booklet is 12 pages. So this is a program that's intended to reach uh, low-income people, um, but the complexity sometimes can hinder that goal. Um, and it, because it depends on factors like income and household size and heating expenses, um, it has uh, often been classified, the light heat program overall, as you know, a small but uh, real fossil fuel subsidy. So um, with that, I'll jump into the demo. Okay, so from policyengine.org, we have two uh, ways of interacting with the platform. So one is on the household side and one is on the policy reform side. So if you're trying to just understand what your taxes and benefits are today, you'll start with this top one, otherwise you'll go to the uh, policy reform side. And these do interact because once you design a policy reform, you can see how it affects a household and not just society overall. But I'll start here. And what we're gonna do, we can enter just a few pieces of information, six questions, and that's enough to get us started to figure out what kinds of tax uh, liability someone might have and what benefit eligibility as well. And then we can add a lot more detail from there which we will uh, need to do to really understand the scope of this program. Okay, so we're gonna describe our household. We can calculate acro across multiple years, but we're just gonna go with 2024 now. And let's say we're a single parent of two kids with income at 20,000, that's a bit below the poverty line. Michigan's minimum wage is just above $10, so that's basically a full-time minimum wage worker. Okay, 
single to dependents, and we will select Michigan here. And those kids are gonna be freeloaders this time. Um, and then uh, we're just gonna make one of the kids young so you can kind of see the kinds of benefits that are available to um, parents of young children. Okay, so that's it. We can, uh, that's enough for us to estimate your income taxes, uh, benefit programs like SSI, uh, SNAP, and uh, this one's going away soon, but, um, and also state income tax programs like the heating credit. Okay, so between those programs, we can say that if you take up all the programs available to you and pay uh, all the taxes you're liable for, your income after taxes and benefits is going to go from 20,000 to about 37,000. And this breaks down between benefits, refundable tax credits, which are tax credits that don't depend on your tax liability. So they're effectively, in the in individual uh, arena, they're effectively benefit programs that are paid through the tax code. And then they owe some taxes as well. We can break this down. So they're going to get a certain amount from SNAP. I should also mention that SNAP actually also depends on your utility expenses. So in some ways there's sort of a heating um, energy element to the food stamp program, um, not often talked about. But they're also eligible for WIC, so this is a nutrition program for um, parents of young children and pregnant mothers. And uh, free school meals they also receive, Those are that's a means tested program. Uh, they get about $12,000 from refundable tax credits. Some of these are federal, uh, the biggest ones are, and then Mich Michigan has their own as well. So there's a EITC, Earned Income Tax Credit, and the Child Tax Credit has been in the news the past couple years. Um, so under current law, they will get about uh, $3,000 from that program. And finally, uh, the thing we're here to talk about is Michigan's, they have an Earned Income Tax Credit as well but they get home heating credit. So even though we haven't provided any information about their uh, energy consumption, their heating, um, you actually get a heating credit even if you have zero reported heating expenses. So in this case, they get $144 from the program. And so keep that number in, in your mind because it's about to change. And finally, uh, they do owe payroll taxes and they have some state income taxes. They're below the threshold to owe uh, federal income tax. Okay, so put it all together again, um, $144 from the heating credit, and overall it turns their net income from 20,000 earnings to 37,000. Now we can um, add some more, let's see, let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. Um, and we've got some summary of this on the left side. But we're gonna add uh, one piece of detail here, which is the heating expense. So now you can search for, we have hundreds of different variables to really fine tune the um, information about your household. So I'm just gonna type in heating, heating costs for each person. Um, and let's say they have $3,000 of heating expenses. Michigan's kinda cold. Okay, so that now we are going to see my details and that number bumped up a little bit. So. It was, I think, 36.7, now it's about 37 flat. And if we go here, back to Michigan refundable credits, it bumped up from 144 to 314. So that's a $170 difference. Effectively, you divide by 3,000 in expenses. They're basically paying a, getting a 5%, 6% subsidy on their uh, heating expense. So, we would expect a program like that to sort of increase the um, amount of expenditure on heating. There's a few more pieces of analytics I wanna show um, before we move on to the policy reform side. So you might be interested in not just the current scenario, I think this is where policy analysts, um, especially thinking about if you were to, we don't have this in the app right now because it's really geared toward um, the individual earning side, but you could imagine uh, a version of a chart that shows as your heating expenses goes up, how much do you get from that credit? This is a flavor of that for the earnings scenario. So what we're doing is we're varying their earnings, holding everything else constant, and we're saying how's their net income change? So in general, it goes up and to the right. There's a small cliff here, um, so we shade those cliffs. 
Um, that's who the food stamp program has a, a small cliff. And uh, here's sort of where they are right now, 20,000 and 37,000 earnings. But we can look at any individual program here too. So if we're interested in that uh, home heating credit, we can now see, okay, what is the shape of that sort of income testing of the program? So they're getting uh, 314. They could get as much as about 1,200 from the program. So that number also is going to uh, depend on your heating expenses, and basically you get at least some of it as long as your earnings are below about 27,000. So we've been really excited. We've been playing around with Streamlit uh, for a bunch of um, sort of prototype tooling. Um, so I think this would be a really fun kind of side project to look at how the home heating credit and other energy programs depend on your energy expenses, what kind of implicit subsidy rate is it depending on your earnings and other scenarios. So I think that will feed into, in the future, I'll come sort of at the end, talk about our dynamic modeling um, work. And another parallel you can draw here is we show the marginal tax rate. So this is depending on your earnings, how much does the government take either in the form of taxes or withdrawn benefits? And this shape often surprises uh, folks. So in general, uh, low-income people actually have negative marginal tax rates, which means every dollar they earn, they actually get more than a dollar uh, for that earnings. And that's because there's programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit, which subsidize earnings at that low level. Um, but as you sort of go from about 100 to 200 percent of the poverty line, you tend to see uh, significantly higher marginal tax rates. So you know, just as context, the top marginal rate in the U.S. is 37 percent. But if you're going from 30 to you know, $40,000 income, you're paying over a 70% marginal tax rate as those programs are starting to phase out. So again, sort of a parallel t to this could be the subsidy rate uh, for energy programs. And finally, we actually generate Python code based on all the inputs you've uh, selected. So you can just pull up our Python package and just copy all this code and you're good to go to pull it into another uh, analysis platform you might have or just a Jupyter Notebook or something like that. Okay, so that is current law. We're gonna do two more things here. We're gonna design a reform for this program, see how it affects the household, and then I'm gonna move on to the carbon tax in the UK across the pond. So we've just been in this top button mode. We're gonna go create a reform mode and now, here are all the policy parameters that are in our system. We have thousands of them. So at the state, federal, local level, tax side, benefit side, we break these down across the agencies that administer the programs. So um, IRS is our biggest piece of this, but there's a lot going on in the states. And uh, HHS, for example, administers the TANF program, so we have some rules in there, too. Um, so if we want to change the Michigan home heating credit, we're going to go down to states and uh, Michigan tax income and credits. So you can sort of see all the different programs we model. Um, so one of the parameters of this, they sort of have, I think there's about 30 or 40 parameters that go into the, um, the calculation of this credit. And after they do that, I think what happened is they probably ran out of money one year, so they just said, once we do that full calculation, we're also going to um, add a multiplier on. So in 2022, they went from 100% to 90%, and then it fell to 56% um, as of 2023. That's the latest that is in the law. So you could imagine what happens if we just change that to 100% starting this year. So now we're updating the rules. So this parameter history, and we have a sort of parallel reality where we're looking at a different version of the law. And it's a little scrunch on the screen, but you can sort of see we've actually got that, um, that parameter provision is here in the left side. You can develop a reform that has as many provisions as you want. So you can really design very rich, detailed uh, reforms. And now we can go back and see how does this affect my household. So we're now running over this um, parallel scenario. And same kind of thing, we'll be able to see how 
the program depends on your earnings under this new regime, how the marginal tax rates change, and also we'll be able to explore the reform in uh, Python. So we define it in there for future analysis. Okay, so your credit rose to 46 and we can drill in and as expected, this is only affecting the home heating credit. So this now becomes a personalized calculator. You can also just, we've got a URL here where you can drop the household ID and now you can just um, share this with anyone after you've designed your reform and they plug in their household information and get the result. Cool, okay, so that is where I will leave the US. I think i um, going to move on to the UK. So we have a, because we've been around longer in the UK, our model's a bit more developed there. We actually have a carbon tax in the model. Um, and we've done that by applying some machine learning techniques to bring in information from disparate data sources. So in general, for example, in the US, where um, you have a survey data set, it doesn't usually have consumption information in the same survey data set as the really rich income data that we use for models like these. So what we've done is integrate all those different data sources so that we can get a sense of, for every individual in the economy, what is the consumption of uh, fuel for their home, for their vehicle, was there consumption of manufactured goods and food, all of those things have a different carbon intensity and we can use that information to estimate the personal impact of a carbon tax. So I sort of ran this before, did some calculation, found that what we can look at is a revenue neutral, sort of uh, fully funded uh, carbon dividend where you're pairing a carbon tax of 100 pounds per ton with an 18 pound per week, uh, basically basic income uh, dividend. So let's see how that looks at policyengine.org slash UK. Um, same kind of thing, we're gonna skip over the tax and individual side and just move to the policy reform. <coughs> And here, same kind of thing, uh, organized by departments that um, meant nothing to me before getting into the UK policy modeling world. Um, but just as a couple other examples, so Ofgem is their energy sort of administrator. Um, so they have a program that came out in the pandemic called the Price Guarantee. And similar to before, that's the, a function of a couple things. One is the price level that they set. Um, so we can sort of look at the trajectory of that parameter and the actual uh, guarantee. So this is basically ensures that people uh, with certain characteristics do not pay above a certain amount in total energy costs. Um, so sort of a implicit also um, energy subsidy. Um, and then they reimburse the energy companies for the cost. But what we're gonna do is look at, instead of an existing program, a hypothetical program and to do that, we go to this contributed section. Um, the UBI Center is sort of the organization that sponsored that. So now we can look at a carbon tax, zero, sadly, today. Um, but we can bump up to 100 and shows up there. And now um, the last thing is we're gonna just add uh, a flat basic income. So every person in the UK gets 18 pounds per week and now calculate economic impact. You can sort of see, we can scroll through the provisions of the reform. And there we go. So because I ran this uh, yesterday, it was instant, saved in our, our cache. Normally it takes about, in the UK, about 20 seconds to run. In the US it's more like a minute. We have much more complicated, at every level of government, just way more complicated than the UK. Um, so, this is basically budget neutral. You could sort of tweak it to get a little bit closer. But basically, the carbon tax is paying for this full basic income. And we give a summary of the uh, impact of this reform. So lowers poverty by about 12% and um, benefits about two thirds of the population, leaves about one third worse off. And here are all the kind of impacts we can look at. So we could look at more detail on the tax and benefit side. So as you can see, basically in the scheme of the, the actual program, um, essentially budget neutral. It raises about 64 billion per year and spends about 63 billion. And 
If you have more detail here, you can sort of look by program. But now we have a distributional impact. So um, we're looking at income deciles here. The average impact is on the y-axis. So actually the bottom income decile, which does not always correspond exactly to consumption decile, and that's sort of what the carbon tax is going to be um, levied on, is actually gonna be a bit worse off, but the rest of the bottom half on average is benefiting from the policy. And then the top decile is really um, paying a lot in even after the, the benefit. We also break this down by wealth decile. So this is sort of where consumption might be a sort of function of income and wealth. Um, in general, older folks might have less income, but they have more wealth, and that allows them to have uh, the deciles here in the rows, and the folks in dark blue, those are the ones who are benefiting a lot. So they're gaining at least 5% of their net income as a result of the policy. So even though there's, for example, in the bottom decile, uh, on average they're worse off, um, actually a majority of people come out ahead from the policy. 56% um, are either dark blue or light blue, which means they gain less than 5%. Um, and there, there are some people who are worse off. So, and similarly, kind of the top decile on average is losing uh, over 2,000 pounds a year, but there are some people in the top decile who are actually coming out ahead from the policy. So these are p people who have high income but low carbon intense consumption. And then you can look at the, the average here is just 64% um, gain, 38% gain a lot, um, and then the remaining folks uh, come out behind. Same kind of thing when it comes to wealth. Um, and actually here again, um, by wealth, the bottom decile comes out um, better off. Now we can look at the poverty rate and see that overall it reduces poverty by 12%. Again, kind of a nuanced story because poverty is really a, an income-based measure. So senior poverty who are more likely to have um, low income but high wealth and thus high consumption of carbon intense uh, goods and services, their poverty rate actually rises slightly. Deep poverty, this is a share of folks below half the poverty line, and a similarly kind of tricky story. So overall, it actually rises a little bit, um, but it falls for kids. So, you know, we've actually begun one project that is going to um, optimize policies for a certain goal. So you're exploring the space of all these policy parameters. One of those might be sort of ensuring that you don't um, increase deep poverty or something like that. And then we break this down by further categories um, and we show the income inequality impact. We are about to launch this labor supply impact. So it, you can actually do it today, it's sort of in beta, um, where you can describe your own elasticities and this is where, um, again, we'd just love to apply this to the energy sector to figure out, depending on your assumptions of how the economy responds to these energy policy levers, was the impact on uh, emissions, for example. Um, so I didn't specify any elasticities here, so there's no impact, but you can sort of expect that we're going to have that in there. Um, we actually do reproduce uh, the micro simulation results in our Python package. And the last thing I'll show here is um, we have an AI powered, this is our GPT-4 analysis product. So what we do is we take all that information that we were sending into those charts, we just take them as JSON, we give, um, we give some instructions on how to write a report, and then we have three different modes, explain like I'm five, normal, and wonk mode. We're going to wonk mode here. and. Uh, now this is calling the GPT-4 API and just writing a full report on the impact. Um, okay, 
so, something might be a little up here. Maybe I'll come back to that, and hopefully we'll be surprised by a, a AI generated report. But one of the cool things is um, we actually, so it writes a report in real time, you can sort of see the streaming text, and it also, we have it include placeholders for the charts. So it sort of fills in those uh, charts. It's like a multimodal um, hack, so that's fun. Okay, um, so while that's going, I'll just mention a couple other policies we're uh, doing in the space. So um, I talked about state tax credits, including those that involve utility expenses. Um, talked about the carbon tax. I showed you the energy price guarantee. So some of those energy policies we, uh, we modeled that you show or you saw. We also do model some of these individual tax credits from the IRA. So for example, the clean vehicle uh, credit we did analysis of. And that has some interesting uh, interactions with income, actually, because until this year, it was not refundable, which meant that you had no opportunity to receive a benefit from it if your income was too low to owe taxes. Um, and the extent of your benefit sort of depended on how much taxes you owed. That's now changed in 2024, but there's still an income limit. So if you earn below, I think, 75,000 if you're a individual and there's some other income limits for your different filing statuses, it has actually a cliff. Um, so we do model all of those interactions. Uh, the SNAP utility expense deduction, one other um, implicit energy subsidy. And then there's some, uh, we actually have a partner who's using our API for benefit navigation in California. So we've done some additional um, policy modeling there, including the electricity discounts that the state has enacted. A few things just to give you a flavor of what is coming up. So um, both our rules, our modeling side, and the user experience, we hope we can do more to support the energy transition in the future. So more of these light heat programs, Michigan's actually the only one so far that we've modeled, but we'd love to uh, model those across the whole country. Um, and also some of these IRA rebates, there's been that state-specific rules, even though IRS has issued guidance, states have some leeway, so we haven't yet incorporated all of that. On the modeling side, uh, in the UK, we've integrated those uh, expense data. So uh, how much from consumption data do we think people in our survey um, are spending on different categories that are going to um, affect their eligibility for benefits and tax credits. So we'd like to incorporate that. We're working on integrating with an open source dynamic macro model. This is also part of that policy simulation library I mentioned. Um, OGUSA is what it's called, and that's um, an overlapping generations model. It has actually been used for some um, energy analysis in, in the past as well. And then we, uh, you know, this would be a pretty new direction for us, but we'd love to explore if we could put some actual energy models in so we can figure out the impact on emissions from, for example, some of these more hidden policy levers that are at the state and federal level. And finally, we have a, we have a long list for improving the UX. We're um, currently probably about to start a new UX redesign and research project. Um, one of the things that comes into effect, especially for the EV credits, there's a lot of different specific questions on a, one program. So how much of your batteries are from you know, North America? All those kinds of nuanced questions. We'd like to just have a smart design sequence. So if you're interested in that program, we can automatically figure out what questions we want to ask you. But do this scaling across the hundreds of programs we model. And that sort of touches to the mini apps um, idea. And then we're eager to expand the third-party developers. Uh, you know, and I think that's been a really successful way for us to get our footprint with people who have the strongest connections to their community. Um, the AI kind of, let's see where this is. OK, there we go. Um, so we do have this AI tool. I'm sorry you missed the streaming. Um, but here it goes. We are sort of describing the reform. So this is all AI generated. But it's not actually doing the AI. The AI is not doing the policy analysis. It's just pulling out the information from our, um, from our model and doing it that way. Let's see. OK, so the prompt. Yeah, the prompt's not working. But yeah, there we go. So we'd like to expand this. And actually, I'm giving a talk on this next week um, into an AI-powered chatbot where you can just ask directly what would the impact on poverty of a carbon tax set at $20 per ton be? 
and it runs that through our model, answers the question directly. Uh, this has actually worked fairly well in some early prototypes. Um, and then just you know, making this more accessible to more researchers, having things like R and all that. Um, but overall, we hope that this kind of can contribute to the space. I know we're a little bit outsiders working in the more sort of tax and benefit economic space, but all the kind of policies that happen in the energy space ultimately do affect individuals in positive and negative ways. We hope that our distributional analysis and tying it to the policymaking process in the CBO kind of uh, flavor can really advance the conversation and we're eager to uh, partner with especially the open source community that we've benefited so much from in the past. So I will leave it there and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, great presentation. First of all, I want to make sure I heard one thing correctly. Did you guys work on the CARE program out in California? Yes. Interesting. Now, affordability is an issue everywhere, and um, I work in the state of Maryland, and we're starting to look at affordability mechanisms. What did you guys learn from some of the pushback that the state of California received? How would you, if you would, do it differently? How would you? Interesting. So we weren't as involved in the design of it. We're, we um, included it in the model so that our API partner can present it to their users. Um, I'll give you one example, though. So CARE and FARA, are, it's just a pair of programs. One of them is for low income. The other is for like low plus not quite as low income. And it turns out basically nobody actually benefits from the low but not quite low because there are so many interactions with other benefits. So um, you are eligible for the low income version if you're also participating in Medicaid. So that basically makes everyone who would be eligible for the not quite low but uh, still low um, eligible for, for the low one. I think one of the issues that arises in a lot of these programs are trying to strike a balance between policy sophistication and simplicity is you run into welfare cliffs. So this is certainly the case in California's where if you earn above that amount, you lose the entire benefit. They were trying to phase this out with the, the two tiers, but it ended up sort of not actually operationalizing. Interesting, thank you. Thanks so much for that awesome talk. Uh, I run a think tank that works on climate and energy uh, at the state level. And so I'm really curious about the underlying data for representing all these programs. Uh, as you very well know, the American welfare state does everything the worst possible way, where we like are just profoundly complicated. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you were here yesterday, but there's a group called the No Collective that's trying to gather residential electrification incentives. And those will be, have like, in New York State that I know best, every utility has a different flavor, the rules change every year. So how are you going about collecting and maintaining the stuff? And would you be open to doing kind of an open data community around it to maintain it? Absolutely. I mean, this is kind of the core of our architecture. We're proud of the user experience as well. But um, I think the thing that's really changed our ability to develop such a wide scope of programs is our open source ethos. And that's, for example, have folks heard of Democracy Lab ever? It's a platform where people who are interested in figuring or just contributing to the open source uh, projects for good can go. And it's their homepage is sorted by the most active uh, projects on GitHub, and so we're usually on sort of the front page. So we just get a ton of people who want to contribute in some way, and because there are so many programs, so much need for updating them, we hope AI can help in the future, but for now, we just have a big team of folks who are going through the legislative language, the benefit program documents, those tax forms, and turning them to, into code. We have a, a strong onboarding process for making sure that they're effective. We have a lot of tests, and I think that helps bring on new people uh, safely. Um, and yeah, so I think we would be really glad to figure out how to partner on open data to, on, yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, thank you all again. I'll let you get some uh, extra coffee then. <laughs>